I think. Okay. Ah, perfect. There we are. And we are live, live again uh, with our baseballs webinar series. Um, we're going to give just a couple minutes to, but uh, for people to load up. But Shannon, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It's, uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be on, on your podcast. Oh, well, it is such a fun time. You do such great work, and we're going to dive a little more into that as well. Um, as we get people loading in and clicking in, it does take a little bit now on here. Mm -hmm. uh, now, um, for everyone who is joining or um, has joined me, you know, this is going to be, this is recorded and uploaded to YouTube. Um, so you can always watch it later as well, but make sure you click the like and the subscribe so that you're able to be notified when we're going back live again. All right, and so we're getting some folks to join back in now. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So folks, thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Dr. Chris Mingus. I am the Chief Veterinary Officer from Base Paws. Um, and here today we have with us Shannon Falconer of Because Animals, uh, who is going to talk to us about cultured meat and and food sources, alternative food sources that we really start to think of as we have more and more technology for our pets. So again, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to talk about uh, to talk about all of this with you and, and your years. So yes, it's great. Now, you know, I I have I've got your background here. I mean, yes, I do. But I, I'm going to butcher this. And I, I know there's a lot of high points on there. But I want why don't you give people an introduction for um, kind of how, how you got to where you are today? Like, where, where did you start? And where did you start studying? And, mm -hmm. and then how did that transition? All? Yeah, I guess, well, to begin, probably the most most importantly, um, I grew up with three cats and three dogs. And, um, and they were, I was an only child. So they really were like my siblings when I was growing up. Um, so I was I was never without any animals. Um, and usually I preferred even playing with my cats to, you know, having my friends over. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I really, I, uh, I developed a close relationship with um, non human animals at a young age. Um, I stopped eating meat at a, at a young age as well, um, in my very early teens, uh, for animal ethics reasons. Um, and, uh, and then in my late teens, volunteering with uh, various shelters and charities, uh, and then continued to do that throughout my, my adult life. Um, but I, I also have a, uh, a, a real curiosity and interest in science. Um, so I'm, I'm from Toronto. Um, I'm a Canadian. I went, I did my master's in biochemistry at the University of Toronto. Then I did a PhD in um, microbial chemical biology at a uh, university, just McMaster University, just outside of Toronto. Um, and then I went to Stanford University to actually study, it was microbiome based uh, work. Um, and uh, yeah, but all the while, you know, throughout sort of my many years at the bench and, and doing science, um, total other world, right, from animal rescue, but uh, I would always have <laughs> some number of um, animals at home that I was, that were either my own or uh, fostering or rescues. Um, so it's just, yeah, a big, a big part of my life. And I guess it was while I, well, it was while I was at Stanford and I, um, I have long struggled with, um, uh, well, two things. I mean, me being somebody who's never, who, who for a long time has not eaten meat, um, being basically being forced to feed my cats um, and the feral colonies that I was tending to, these meat-based diets, um, because that's what cats eat in the wild and that's what, uh, that's what they need in order to survive. And that's all that's available to feed them. So uh, nonetheless, I mean, of, of course I was gonna do that, but, um, but it's nonetheless, it was a conundrum that, you know, it's having to sort of, I guess, uh, promote an industry that I otherwise don't agree with in, in at all, um, the mm -hmm. animal agriculture industry or certainly factory farming. Um, and so while I was at Stanford and, uh, you know, it's just this magical place in the world, right, where anything and everything is, is possible. And I think it was there that I really developed the, I just gained the courage and sort of this awareness, like, yeah, of course I can, I can do this. Um, ultimately what I had decided was I, I didn't want to be continuing um, my science to do science in a way that didn't actually contribute somehow to taking animals out of the supply chain because it's mm -hmm. just too important to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, I decided that I wanted to, to, yeah, take my scientific knowledge and, and do that. So, um, yeah, it was very, very shortly thereafter. I mean, it happened very fast when I made the decision. Um, 
And then I met my co-founder named whose name is Joshua Eret, and he's also from Toronto. Um, and interestingly, we didn't meet in Toronto, despite the fact that we both ran in the same cat rescue circle in Toronto for many years. So it's sort of funny. Um, but when Josh and I met while I was in California, but um, and we were introduced through uh, a mutual friend, and I was I was looking for a business partner, and Josh had just finished his MBA um, and has a background in finance, and uh, we were both looking for a way to to basically feed our our cats, our pets, a more nutritious diet that did not also harm the environment and other animals. And so then it just happened really quickly. We said, okay, we're, we're gonna do this. And this was four and a half years ago now, I suppose. And um, so it was, uh, yeah, within a matter of two weeks, I sort of gave my resignation <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> very naively. Um, and thank goodness I was naive just to, you know, the startup world otherwise, cause it's tough, right? I'm not sure it would have been hard to just knowing how hard it actually is. Um, I wonder in retrospect, like what I would have just, you know, been so frivolous, but so I'm glad I did it of course. Um, and we got going. So, so, and yeah, the rest has been four and a half years of, of building this company because animals um, started with, uh, we, we do have some products on the market for anybody mm -hmm. who goes to our website, they can see we have a, a, a supplement, one for a probiotic based supplement, one for cats, one for dogs. And we also um, have nutritional yeast based dog cookies. And so we started with um, basically just building up uh, our brand, our mission, um, what we're doing, and we're using these other cultured ingredients. So the way, um, so people are very familiar, most people are very familiar with probiotics and the benefits that they bestow on us and our pets. Mm -hmm. And so the, the term culturing really just means, you know, you take this this organism, or, or um, if it's not an entire organism like a bacteria, it would be a cell, and you provide it with all the nutrients it needs to grow. And so that's what, you know, people do when they grow probiotics. Um, similarly, nutritional yeast, um, which is chock full of, of uh, B vitamins and is a, is a complete protein. Um, similarly, they take these cells and in a, in a tank, you know, when people go to breweries, right, and they see these big fermentation tanks, that's what's growing in there, these yeast, you give it the media or the nutrients they need to grow. Um, and so what we decided was, okay, we're going to put these other really great and healthy products in the market for people to just start to understand that, um, you know, remind themselves that oh cultured products yeah we can get a lot of we can extract a lot of value from them um and meanwhile we have this scientific team that's also creating this new cultured product which is actually meat um and so it actually is meat it's not a it's not even a meat alternative or a meat analog mm -hmm. it's actual meat um it's just that it's produced in a different way so as opposed to raising and slaughtering an animal to take that meat. Um, we take a cell from, or a very, very, very small biopsy from an animal. And then from those, that small, small collection of cells, we can indefinitely continue to grow those cells in, again, the media that they need. The, when I say media, I mean the nutrients they need to grow mm -hmm. um, and form just all of the, the, the meat cells um, that people know and are you know, that they feed their pets, but we're sourcing that meat from a different place. Um, so that's what we're working on right now at Because Animals. That's sort of the, that's, I'd say, yeah, we're selling these early products, but our, our main mission is to create this meat. Well, and that's so exciting, you know, being able to have this sort of indefinite meat source um, that you're able to grow and control from there. Now, when you say um, an indefinite meat source, is there, you know, is there differences between different um, kind of types of meat, whether from from beef or chicken and growing in these sorts of things? And what, what type are y'all um, aiming to work for? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. Um, so I guess for any pet parent, um, if they look at the, the ingredient list on their pet's food, they probably see chicken mm -hmm. in most of them uh, or beef or seafood. Um, those would be the, the main types of meat that go into to pet food. Um, in the wild, I mean, keeping in mind that in the wild, a feral cat um, is never going to stalk and take down a cow um, or even a chicken for that matter, frankly, right? In the wild, cats evolved and they, they cats evolved eating mice, small mm -hmm. birds and insects. Um, and for feral cats, so who are not socialized and living, living in a home, um, still in outside, if they're not being tended to by a colony caretaker, um, being fed a chicken-based diet, they are still consuming 
mice. So um, the reason why pet food, though, is, of course, made with these other protein sources that pets did not evolve eating is because they're left over from the human food chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly, I think, as, as you know better than me, Chris, um, the main allergens for cats and dogs um, are, in terms of protein sources, anyhow, are chicken and bovine. So for us, it made a lot of sense to say, well, if we're going to culture meat, um, why would we do it with a protein source that our pets actually didn't evolve eating? Why don't we actually actually, why don't we grow that protein source that is much more natural for our pets? Um, and they may be more, you know, that may actually be healthier and safer for them. So we started with mouse, mouse tissue for cats, um, mm -hmm. since that is really what cats do eat in the wild. And so we're working on a cultured mouse for cats. Uh, and that that will be, that's our, our first, um, that's the first product line we're working on um, in terms of cultured meat, and then a, a cultured rabbit for dogs. Oh, that and that's so amazing. I mean, that's such a nice approach because, of course, you when you even think about the logistics of making a food out of mice for for cats, it would just be uh, there'd be so much that went into it. But being able to take the animals out of it and being able to add that culture in there makes that process and being able to kind of mass produce that process would be would be so interesting. Our, you know, from a I don't know if this is too much or too much of an information to ask right there, but you know, from a, a timeline standpoint, is there a time that you're looking to launch your food or, or kind of have that available? Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty aggressive timeline. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, though, that we can hit it. Um, what we're looking to is we're looking to actually, um, uh, I guess, launch our first limited batch version of our, our cultured mouse cat treat uh, mm -hmm. at the end of 2021. Um, and it would be it would be a limited batch um, for any cultured cultured meat company in the industry. We're the only ones doing pet food, cultured meat for pet food, but there are other, many other startups in the space making cultured meat for human food. Um, and because cultured meat is, it's, um, it's a, it's a new technology, but at the same time, it's also a very old technology in that, you know, people have been culturing tissue um, mm -hmm. in the lab for, for research purposes, just to better understand basic fundamental questions around science and life um, for for many, many, many decades. Um, and um, I mean, yeah, I would I would say even centuries, but in much, much, much more rude around. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, so but over the past decade, certainly we've we've acquired a tremendous amount of knowledge. And so um, it's not it's not a difficult technology to do um, just grow, mm -hmm. grow tissue outside of an actual organism. Um, but the, the, the tricky part is actually bringing down the cost. Um, so scaling it, um, making lots and lots and lots of that tissue at a price point that's feasible for, for people. So, um, so yeah, those, that's, those are the challenges. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, we are optimistic that we'll, we'll be able to create enough at a, um, at a uh, price point that's affordable enough that we can launch a limited supply batch end of 2021. Oh, that's going to be amazing. I'm going to, so everyone, make sure you sign up for that limited supply batch. Make sure yeah, you're as limited yeah. as possible on there. It's a like yeah. such a fantastic, fantastic idea. Now you mentioned I'm going to kind of make us talk about some things that probably aren't aren't as pleasant a little bit. You know, some of that that driver is is you mentioned there's uh, to to move away from that animal resource or kind of the the, the current um, agricultural animal. Um, industry mm -hmm. and so kind of what are some of the negatives just for people knowing that there's from a resource standpoint um you know the ethics ethics of course of of taking animals life is concerning with for everybody but from a resource standpoint as well is there what is the impact on the earth from from that general industry right now yeah, no, it's a great and interesting question. I'm glad you asked it because, you know, when I first, um, when I, before I made the, the leap completely to leave my, my academic career, and I was thinking, you know, for me, because I, I am really mission-based in terms of taking animals out of the supply chain, where can I potentially have the most impact? And intuitively, you know, of course, human food, human can, humans contain more animal-derived ingredients than our mm -hmm. pets do. Um, but uh, because we're, we're bigger. And um, so, of course, we need more, we need more calories and we eat more animal animal based calories. Um, but as I as I started to look into it a little bit more and realize, you know, OK, but, you know, there are a lot of other players in the space who are also working on this. Um, 
also, of course, humans are omnivores, which means, you know, even if, which means that we don't need meat to survive, right? We can live long, very healthy lives, arguably healthier than people who even eat meat. Um, so we don't need meat. Um, but can we say the same for our pets? Um, dogs are known to be omnivores, um, mm -hmm. but cats in particular are this carnivorous species. Um, and in the wild, their only source of complete nutrition is, is in consuming another animal. So there will never be a plant-based option um, for cats. Uh, and, and even if there was, it would be, um, uh, you know, arguably it may not be as bioavailable uh, mm -hmm. in terms of, in terms of just the actual synthesis of the, of the, the food. So, um, so, so then there's the issue of, okay, well, you know, humans, there's plant-based options, but for pets, they're not. Um, and then looking at the sustainability piece, um, actually, there's a recent study that was published that showed that more than a quarter of the environmental impacts of the factory farming industry in terms of um, deforestation, water and fossil fuel use is directly attributed to the foods that Americans feed their cats and dogs. Mm. So I mean, that's over a quarter between 25 and 30%. I mean, that's a huge percentage in terms of contribution um, of that environmental impact um, mm -hmm. of raising animals for food. So um, so this would be, so I think, yeah, it, it, you know, a short list of, you know, the reasons why we should really be thinking a lot about the food that we're feeding our pets. Yes, there's, of course, the animal ethics issues. There's also climate change sustainability. Um, there's also the issue around antibiotic use. And a lot of people don't think about this, but, um, uh, so antibiotics, which are, you know, a lot of people, for example, who um, like cancer patients um, go in, pe people who suffer from, uh, so if they're leukemia, they go in for some kind of a, um, a bone marrow transplant. Many, many of these people don't actually die of cancer. They die of infection. Uh -huh. um, and I know that while I was doing my postdoc and we were doing a lot of micro microbiome work, right, and looking at um, the various pathogens or the, the microbes in our body that, um, that could become pathogenic in this immunocompromised state. Anyway, the point is that there are virtually, we're in this sort of post-antibiotic era at the moment where we don't have a lot of options when people get sick with a, with a bacterial infection. Um, and it's pretty grim. Um, and we are using our antibiotic supply uh, in a way that's not very judicious. And 80% uh, of the antibiotics that are made in the United States go to animal agriculture, mm -hmm. not to humans, not to save humans or, or pets mm -hmm. for that matter, it goes to animal agriculture. So it's a huge driver of the development of antibiotic resistance. Um, and then, of course, with COVID, um, this is another another part that we we're just sort of starting to become more cognizant of, um, and which is that you know, concentrating animals in any space, whether or not it's a wet market in China or it's a chicken factory in Illinois, mm -hmm. um, if there is a virus that is um, that where where you can actually see zoonotic transmission, um, it usually is pretty bad. Um, and and as we've seen, of course, with COVID. So and then in turn, now there's this there is the U.S. is going through a, um, a meat shortage. Uh, as the supply chain of meat is very very shaky at the moment. So um, so there are numerous reasons why we re really need to reevaluate how we are actually feeding not only ourselves but our pets. Um, and, but because pets are, you know, their diet really, meat is a really, really central ingredient in our pet's diet, um, we need to think about that really um, in, a, in a serious way. Absolutely. And, you know, of course, as you mentioned, and just to, to make sure folks know that when, when you mentioned that, that meat is a central part of the diet, it's really around that, that taurine amino acid that cats cannot produce. And that's what makes them what we call obligate carnivores, mm -hmm. so that they do need to have have that to to help their heart. Um, and there's, like I say, the 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 resources or the the potential effects of this, not just for that like that animal ethics, but that resource potential is such so key and so crucial. Um, we're starting to get some great questions roll in on here, um, and we may start bouncing back and forth from them. But uh, I know it's just you know the the culture. And I, I still sometimes I can't get over the the, the neatness. The, I think the idea of of being able to culture meat. Now, so you mentioned that you're starting with with mice and rabbits, uh, mice for cats, and then the rabbit line for dogs. Um, is there any? Would there be any like plans of expansion after that? I know that might be way too far in the future, but kind of from from an interesting standpoint, from a mix and match or anything like that. 
Um, well, definitely. I mean, after that, we, we do have, we are thinking about it. I mean, we're really sort of focused right now on those two species lines, just mm-hmm. because they are sort of, we see them as being really central pieces within our cat's diet, our cat and dog's diet. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely, um, I think at that point, it will be about what are customers wanting, wanting mm-hmm. support to feed their pets. Um, and so probably the next, um, the next type of species after that would be in response to what customers are asking for. Well, certainly. And, you know, one of our questions that came up from Alma, who's joined us a fair amount of times, and so it's great to see her back again, um, is she was shocked to learn about chicken allergies. So, so many products have chicken. And when when you start to think about being able to culture culture meat and choose a protein source, you know, um, are there any kind of food allergy effects that you've thought of or maybe possible to use through your product? Um, well, I mean, yeah. Now we we would still need to you know verify this. But the, 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 long, I know there's a lot. I put a, that's, I put a big question on you. I put a big question on you. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a. Um, I I just say uh, so intuitively. You know, we would we our hypothesis is that um, that mouse tissue um, will be if if it's at least not totally hypoallergenic, um, there is less allergic response to cultured mouse than there would be to chicken. Um, again, just because cats, that is the meat, that is the protein that cats evolved eating. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, so yeah, we would, so our argument, and we, we will of course, you know, continue to, to verify this, but we would say that this is something, in, we would be able to call our, our product hypoallergenic. We're looking to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. And that's, uh, being, like I say, being able to source, you have this ability to control and source in such a different manner. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of the things, even the antibiotic use didn't quite come to my my mind first off. Um, it's so kind of far in the future that we don't see as, as many different things from there. Uh, you know, and then there's just a, another one that's, I'm going to bring up just from a, a genus side. And this is, uh, some of these are product and way far off. So, so forgive me if I keep asking them on those, but Gina has a really big question on there. Mainly is, is will you be able to produce meat primarily itself for, or rather will you be able to purchase directly the cultured meat or simply only in the ready-made formula at that standpoint? Uh, Uh, Yeah, interesting. Um, No, great question. Um, I mean, I would love to be able to, I would love to say that we would offer, um, we would be able to offer that, that raw source um, at some point for people like Gina, who, who are only, who are interested in just feeding that to their pets. Um, I would love to be able to offer that in the future. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, And I think we, we will try to, uh, as we're, you know, a small startup, um, we, we likely at the outset would launch with a, uh, an already formulized cat food, um, or, or well, initially it would be a treat, so not nutritionally complete. Um, but once we actually do with the nutritionally complete food, um, but following that, yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit, um, and so I, I, I would hope that we are able to at some point um, provide Gina with an ingredient for her cats. Okay, perfect. Well, you know, let's see. There's, I know we've got a lot. We've got some coming in, coming in. We've got a lot coming in on here now. Uh, so take us a little bit back when I'm going to have kind of, I know you talked a little bit about the nutrient and the media when we start to think about culturing and, and growing a piece of, of meat from a donor. So when you say from the donor piece of meat, that's originally from a, a little biopsy. Is that mm-hmm. true? And so what exactly is a biopsy for folks? Yeah, no, I'm, and I, another question I'm glad you asked. Um, so for us, for our mouse tissue, um, what we did was, um, of course, you know, our, our mission at Because Animals is is certainly never to sacrifice and um, and not to harm animals. Um, and so what we did was um, we rescued um, uh, a couple of, or three mice from a, what would otherwise be a research lab. So these mice would have been used for research purposes. Um, so we, uh, with a veterinarian, um, she took a small amount of tissue just from their ear. So she gave them some local anesthetics so they didn't feel anything. And, um, and it basically, it was like a, you know, if I were to go get my ear pierced, um, you had that much, that much tissue. Um, and so we so, took, so minuscule, minuscule. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that much tissue and, and at that, and, um, and that's all we needed. So, and then, and then after the, the veterinarian took that, that small little ear pierce, um, those mice came to us and actually, um, one of our, 
our tissue scientist or our, our stem cell scientist, she um, she actually made uh, a handmade huge mouse mouse hatch for them. So um, they three stories, and so um, those mice, there's three of them, and they they live in in her home in their own mouse hutch. Um, and um, so that was so so their cells um, mm -hmm. are forming the basis of all of our meat in the future, our yeah. mouse meat. That's amazing. Um, and so is that the same process that went along for rabbits as well? For rabbits, yeah, we have not yet. Um, we're focused right now on the mouse, okay. but the next product will be the rabbit and we will do the same thing for rabbit as well. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I, uh, that um, that ideal of not sacrificing, I think is so core to the company yeah. and being able to maintain um, goes from there. I mean, I think this, uh, uh, Melissa, I think asked a question right about here about what what do you foresee happening to the donor mouse and rabbit? But uh, Melissa, we do we do know uh, exactly where those mice are. Um, yeah, yeah, are. they're they're um, they're happy, like running on their wheels, and um, and uh, Magdalena feeds them blueberries every day, and um, so, yeah, no, they're they're living a pretty a pretty good life. Uh -huh. um, all right, so we've got the biopsy, we've got the biopsy now, and so when we start to look at moving into this this growing process, is there anything you can kind of tell us about the growing process that would make it a little easier like you know you say with the nutrients but if we give nutrients do does meat just grow or or um, how do we help that grow yeah no um n no i mean if you just sort of like you know if you stab yourself right now and take that tissue and throw it in a in a bucket and put in some vitamins and amino acids, it's probably not going to do so well. Um, but you need to sort of couple that with, um, so various, various nutrients coupled with, you know, the right, the right temperature, um, mm -hmm. the right amount of oxygen being able to flow through those cells. Um, and so you have to sort of have the mechanistically the, the infrastructure to be able to allow those cells to sort of um, yeah, obtain those nutrients in the way that they would be obtained in the body. Um, I can't say too, too much about the process aside from, I mean, that's sort of, but, but frankly, I mean, without going into scientific detail, I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of it anyway. Um, <laughs> so, and it, it is very much akin to, um, to, you know, for folks who are um, beer fans, like I am, um, and going into a brewery, and if you see those big vats, mm -hmm. um, those are called fermenters or, or bioreactors. Um, and so those those cells go into a bioreactor followed by the specific nutrients that are required. Um, and then that media is heated to a certain temperature that the cells really like. Um, there's the appropriate amount of gas exchange. Um, and when I say gas exchange, I mean oxygen and carbon dioxide. And um, and then those cells just, you know, they sort of, they're in their really happy place and they just divide. Uh, and that's essentially what we're doing with with tissue cells or mouse cells. Yeah, so we're giving, we're giving, so you're giving everything a happy place. You're giving the mouse a happy place yeah. and its cells a happy place. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, um, oh my goodness. All right. So uh, just kind of some basic, again, kind of a little bit of product questions on there. Kind of, is there a shelf life that you would expect? Would that be different because it's a cultured meat product or be very similar um, to kind of what we see today? in pet food? Yeah, great. Really good question. Um, so cultured meat. So the other difference between cultured meat and meat that you eat, animal based meat, animal mm -hmm. produced meat, um, is that so the way that animals are reared um, and, and at time of slaughter and then harvesting their their meat. Um, in, there have been studies that have shown that if you take any any meat from a shelf, a grocery store shelf, and you take it off and then you swab and you try to culture out bacteria, invariably you will get fecal bacteria in there, right? So it's just, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of poop in, um, mm -hmm. that is in the area that any animals raised in and that, that those trace levels of fecal matter and fecal bacteria and enteric bacteria are on meat. And so meat goes bad because at a certain point, um, that meat, those bacteria are allowed to grow on that meat and it, and it goes bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what sort of shelf life and expiry refers to is just how long that food can last before bacteria take it over. Um, and that bacteria tends to be pathogenic. So um, for us, we are growing our meat in conditions that don't, that doesn't involve any poop. So um, <laughs> there are no, there are no fecal bacteria in there. Um, and so, and in fact, we're not, we're also not using antibiotics to grow our meat. 
So, um, so our meat, we expect to have a longer shelf life than you would see from animal produced meat for that reason, because at the outset, there are no, there are just no sort of trace amounts of sort of bacterial cells on there. Mm -hmm. um, that said, of course, as soon as we harvest it and it goes into the environment, bacteria are ubiquitous. So it wouldn't be long before some bacteria would land on it and it would eventually grow out. So I expect the shelf life to be longer, um, but probably not that much longer than mm -hmm. what you would see for a current traditional meat product that's either raw um, or for our for our foods that actually are like fully formulated foods they would also be on par with what um, what pet parents um, expect today from their their foods for their pets okay yeah, and that's so interesting how it's, it is very much more of a, a sterile environment if you will on that standpoint um, now one of the things that, that Melissa was asking this is kind of about some of the ethics and on there um, and this is a little bit about the dogs. Um, while they, like I say, they they are omnivores, so they can't eat both. They can they can technically be vegan, or they can be carnivores on there. Um, and it's thinking mm -hmm. that using a cultured rabbit food um, kind of helps bridge that gap between the the kind of vegan community or and and people who feed meat to their dogs still, but um, don't have that same kind of vegan ethics from there. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I mean, for example, my my dogs are also fed uh, a plant based diet, and they do very, very well. Um, and, uh, and yeah, dogs are omnivores. Um, but there are a lot of people who just want to feed their dogs meat, um, regardless of whether or not, you know, we know scientifically that they're omnivores. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people don't necessarily believe that, um, or they just feel better about feeding their dogs meat, even if sort of, logically in theory they understand that they don't need meat they it just doesn't feel right for them not to feed their dogs meat so we're just saying okay that's cool we'll just give you we'll produce a meat source for you that you can feel comfortable with in terms of you know from the ethical and environmental um and public health uh perspective mm -hmm. now i am going to flash this up here real quick this is from joshua um Aaron, which is you know of yeah. course with y'all and i just yeah. want everyone to be able to see this and i'll put it up at the end as well um, right. if he wants to sign up for the newsletter um for their new about cultured meat um, here is the website. It's becauseanimals.com slash pages slash cultured meat. Um, so if you want to keep it, the update, as you mentioned, it's towards 2021. So keep those updates rolling. So go ahead and sign up for their newsletter there. Uh, <laughs> you're like, yes, thanks. Perfect. Yeah, on there. No, good gosh. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you know, we've, we've talked about the cells. We've talked about the cells, where they come from. And then you mentioned the nutrients. Is there any kind of from the nutrient standpoint, how do you, is there a consideration in sourcing of the nutrients as well um, from whether they be animal product nutrients or, and if not, where where do they end up coming from? Like the various, um, you know, amino yeah. acids or calcium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, really good. I'm glad you asked that too. Um, so one of the traditionally, you know, the, as I talked so much about the scientific community growing cells in the lab for decades now, um, one of the main, the ways that uh, labs are able to do this is they provide the cells with an ingredient known as fetal bovine serum. And that's just exactly what it sounds like. Um, mm -hmm. So the serum or that nu that nutrient rich sort of media um, that surrounds the fetus in a cow, um, that media, that nutrient um, soup is basically uh, taken from the, from the cow or the fetus. It's quite a painful process. And it's, um, and so, you know, ethically, we don't like it. Um, in addition to that, it's also expensive, um, especially when you're producing the amount of, you know, meat that we would need to in order to, you know, to, to feed the world or feed our pets. Um, and, um, and so we are not using that, that, um, that ingredient in our process. Mm -hmm. So what we've done as part of, part of our, our IP or I mean, any cultured meat company is doing it is basically creating their own um, nutrient rich media that does not include this fetal bovine serum. Um, and yeah, we are, we are no different. So our nutrients would come from largely plant or microbial um, sources, mm -hmm. um, including amino acids or, or various other vitamins and minerals. Um, and uh, that's what we would use to basically feed ourselves. 
All right. Well, that might say that's that's also great news to hear. And then, you know, just off the top of my head, if everyone starts using fetal bovine serum, it kind of defeats the purpose of that's right. doing everything anyways, because we already right. still have to raise a cow to get. Yeah. Um, right. So I think moving, that's so great to hear that not only are you advancing it from a culture meat standpoint, but from an ingredient standpoint is really where um, kind of continuing to work on from that standpoint. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, I know we've got some great and some big questions that are rolling on. I'm getting a little distracted by them, but thank okay. you so much for for uh, rolling with me here as we continue on from that standpoint. Uh, now, all right, so we've talked about the biopsy. We've talked about what goes into it, kind of where all those various nutrients go or, or kind of come from so that it can grow. Um, now, talk to me, talk to us a little bit about the process of harvesting. Like what what goes into that? Is that as simple as it sounds or is or is there a process that needs to go to make sure that the culture you have still remains safe and viable to continue to grow yeah so um so with our once we sort of uh, uh we take the sort of few cells and we we put them in the in the bioreactor with all the media um and nutrients and then they grow and they grow and they grow um and and we can start sort of collecting some of those cells over time or we can grow them continue to grow as long as you know until those nutrients are basically depleted from the media um and then basically it is at that point where things become much simpler the harder the hardest part is really just getting the cells to grow in conditions that they're going to be happy in. Um, and then at that point, once they're growing, things are pretty easy. Um, mm -hmm. it, we would just uh, basically concentrate that, that meat. So, um, you know, from there you wash it free of the media, just, you know, you can wash out the media, mm -hmm. um, you concentrate that biomass. Um, and then it becomes what you're left with is sort of almost looks like, um, well, even ground beef is is probably more texturized than what we're mm -hmm. creating, um, but because ours it's really just sort of uh, cells, and so it's sort of like it it's a it's a bit of a meat slurry, if you will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a meat. Slurry. Okay, so it lends itself well right now for that formula formula food um, yeah. because I mean that's that that does that process already occurs. You know when yeah, that, exactly. that that current pet food process is right. It does have to be broken down to be fully formulated before that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and so so you yeah. harvest all of that and then you basically restart and do it again and, and we go from there. Um, so from there, once we harvest that, those cells, that meat, then, you know, that meat goes for food. Um, but what we would have is we would always in the background, you know, we have sort of, um, we have our cells that are constantly, um, that are, are, are growing. And so we can, at any given time there, we can take a sample of those and then start our big culture growth. Um, and so we have this other sort of culture that we could just take from um, at any, at any time. And we just maintain that healthy culture in the background. Yeah, so you've got that. You've got that. Uh, oh my goodness, the 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 mother is that the sour? Yeah, um, yeah that's the kombucha. <laughs> that's kombucha. Oh my goodness, the starter, the starter, the mother, the all of the these starter things. For sourdough, um, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So you've so. got all those working. You've got continual working, so you're able to constantly transplant and re yeah. continually keep that great consistent product on there. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any issues with kind of varying quality that are in the normal meat? kind of in industry itself? Um, so you mean, uh, is, are there quality or consistency issues with the meat that currently goes into yes, pet food? Yeah, kind of. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, there there are. I mean, every year, multiple times a year, the FDA will issue recalls on pet food. Um, mm. And most often, not always, but most often it's because of the meat itself. And so um, pentobarbital, which you know is a euthanizing agent, um, that has been found in pet food. Um, so uh, so the meat that's something for people to be mindful of is that most pet foods, commercial pet foods, um, they don't contain meat that humans would be eating, but they contain meat that um, is either, so it's either the parts of the animal that are left over that humans don't want to eat, or it's those animals that actually died in transit um, or or just didn't ever make it to slaughter due to suffocation, dehydration. Um, so if an, if an animal, sort of a fallen animal, as they're referred to, they, they cannot be consumed by humans. So those animals will go to pet food, um, as well as other, uh, other animals, um, generally, uh, 
yeah, other other types of meat. And so this is all sort of picked up, this 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 type of meat that can't be consumed by humans, and it's sent to something that's called a rendering facility. Mm -hmm. um, and these rendering facilities, um, basically what they then do is they apply really, um, really high pressures and heat and acidification to that meat is all heavily contaminated at this point with bacteria. So that high acid, high heat, high pressure kills in theory, kills the microbes um, for things like pentobarbital that's still in there um, if it ends up making it into that food. So um, that then that meat is what's used to go into pet food. And so, yeah, there are issues around recalls because of salmonella or E. coli. Again, those are those are E. coli bacteria, right? So they would have come from that meat that um, it just wasn't maybe fully uh, it wasn't heated through enough to actually kill the bacteria um, or chemical contamination. So that, those are the types of, that's the type of the meat that typically goes into pet food right now. So mm. yeah, there are safety issues around it um, and there are consistency issues around it as well. Yeah, and like I said, that's, that's the, I think that's in some ways in my mind, kind of the dream from this cultured meat scenario is we're able to fully, you're able, rather mm -hmm. I say we, you're able to fully control it from, from start sure. to finish. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so we know exactly what nutrients we're feeding the the the, the cells, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we can, it, it, as you say, we can ensure that there's no contamination with either bacteria or viruses, um, and and certainly you know chemicals like pentobarbital. Mm -hmm. oh, perfect. And us, it's just such a it's such a great way to to help and advance the industry on there now. This is a little big one. Um, it's, it does come from Melissa again. Um, it talks a little bit about synthetic taurine mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. the use of synthetic taurine to in a, in kind of a base environment. Unfortunately, the comment's a little long. We can't get okay. to the very end of the comment on there. Okay. Um, but from a synthetic storing tan, uh, standpoint, you know, it is with the thought of is do you have any preferences versus synthetic taurine versus kind of the idea of cultured meat and and why do you why why would you go down that route versus the synthetic taurine route? So um, so synthetic taurine is uh, is the same as non synthetic taurine and for anybody who has a cat and keeps them alive with commercial fat food um, they can thank synthetic taurine for that so um, so. Taurine is an amino acid, but it's a it's referred to as a beta amino acid. So it's not actually integrated into protein itself. It's actually a free amino acid. It's very very water soluble. So taurine in the whole um, in the whole pet food manufacturing process, it's typically lost because it's just so water soluble. It's lost. So the meat that goes into pet food is taurine deplete. So there's not enough meat in commercial pet, not enough taurine in the meat of commercial pet food in order to, to basically um, fulfill the nutritional taurine requirements of a cat. So every pet food, I think AFCO requires actually legally um, that, that companies supplement all cat food with taurine. And more than half of the world's industrial taurine is sold to pet food. It goes, it's to feed your cats. So every cat that's kept alive on commercial pet food, commercial cat food, it's synthetic taurine. Um, so synthetic taurine versus natural taurine, chemically, same thing, identical. Um, so I have, uh, for us, you know, if our cells are going to make natural taurine, that's great. Um, but I personally have, there are no there's no reason to have any qualms with synthetic taurine. It's mm -hmm. mm. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and that's just I didn't I did not realize that number was so high that okay. half of half of the world's industrial taurine mm -hmm. goes to our cats. Goes yeah. to our cats in there. I mean, that is that is an amazing statistic. Um, yeah. Oh my goodness, there's there's just so much uh, there's so much I want to ask you about right now, but um, gotta kind of keep that a little keep it a little rolling on here. So. All right, so we've talked about that. We talked about how we harvest um, and and the the meat aspect of it. You know, you mentioned on here that that the meat is taurine deplete from typically. Are are, are you aiming to make yours um, taurine sufficient? Is that a possibility for you? Is that yeah. something you still may so? Um, yeah, no, that's um, that that's definitely something that we are we're looking to do. So we're mindful of the fact that even though synthetic taurine is the same as natural taurine, um, that m people still really like the idea of the taurine just being the meat being nutritionally complete, um, replete with taurine. Um, so we are looking at actually harvesting our tissue with taurine in there as opposed to supplementing it. 
Because that's what people want, not because I it, it's necessarily what cats need, but people want it. Okay, yeah, I mean, there is there is a kind of always a little bit varied on there. Now, Melissa kind of broke her question down a little bit for us, um, mm -hmm. made it a little bit easier to, to see on there. Um, and so kind of her big question on there is, you know, if, if it's the same touring, this kind of same synthetic touring, then then why, why go down the cultured meat route? Um, why not go down kind of a, kind of a plant or a vegan based shop? Oh yeah, uh, no, great question. Um, so, so those key nutrients like taurine, um, arachidonic acid, vitamin D, so many of those key nutrients that cats need to survive, um, many of them are no longer in the meat. So that is actually in commercial cat food. Um, really what that, that nutrient that the commercial cat food, the meat, the nutrient that the meat is supplying once it's, full, once it's been processed is just protein. Mostly it's just protein. All of the other necessary um, vitamins like taurine and, and, uh, pre, and preformed vitamin A, they're added back um, as synthetic versions. So, um, so, so those nutrients, so yeah, vegan cat food is definitely, it's, it's definitely possible. Um, and those products do exist. Um, mostly pe people don't feel comfortable feeding their cats a vegan, a, a totally meat-free food, despite the fact that it's possible. Um, and so recognizing that most people don't want it, um, and because our mission is to take animals out of the supply chain, yeah. we've opted to give them the product that they want. Um, but it is it is possible to do it with all of these other just adding back all of these synthetic nutrients. Um, the key it would also be with the um, plant based proteins is plant based protein. So as I mentioned, it's the protein that's actually the main nutrient in the meat. We're really the only nutrient left in the meat. Um, but the difference there is a difference between the amino acid profiles of plants and animal products. Um, but that's not difficult to circumvent if you just supplement again with the individual amino acids that tend to be limiting in plants. Um, so again, it's not a hard one to do, um, but people don't like to see a whole litany of um, ingredients in their pet's food because they like the idea of feeding their pet's meat um, and having very few synthetic ingredients in there. So it's, as Melissa's pointed out, it's totally possible. Um, it's just that most people don't want to do it. So we're going to give them the, pro the, the product people want. Uh, perfect. And that's, I think that's so key when you start to think about the mission is you're not thinking just about this one, about how, but how it starts to have your ripple effects, your ripple mm -hmm. effects potentially for the agricultural industry, for the world, and for the animals that are in that potential supply chain as well. Now, um, we did have a quick question from Alma. Will I be able to read? watch this webinar. Um, she says that we are covering lots of great info, um, but it is a lot of info and she may need to cover, come back and learn a little more. And of course, Alma, you can, we do have YouTube recordings of all of our webinars and we'll post that back up as soon as it gets to YouTube. So you'll be able to come back and join in at any point or for any specific questions. Um, now there's other, we've got some really interesting questions, questions that honestly I had not quite yet thought of yet, but um, are you still ready? You ready? Yeah. We've got another one from Sandy. But Sandy says, do you think pet parents are going to be more accepting of a cultured meat product instead of one that comes from kind of that insect based product as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's hard to say. I mean, as you know, if we if we just think about it from that sort of ancestral diet perspective, um, in addition to to mice, yeah, cats eat, they eat insects. So crickets would be among them. Um, I'm not sure about the fly larvae as much, but definitely the the, um, the crickets. Um, and so yeah, it may be, to be honest, um, I'm not sure. Um, well, I think there's well, we know that there's a lot of per, there's a lot of humanization that goes on in pet food. So people do tend to really want to feed their pets. They feel better about feeding their pets foods that are more similar to what we or they eat themselves. Um, not to say that people are going to eat cultured mouse, um, but it is a it is a meat versus um, sorry, it would be a mammalian meat versus um, like an avian or a, um, a another mammalian meat. Um, and insects just haven't taken off in the at least in North America. I should say really um, in North America, the whole insect protein market hasn't taken off for humans. But it may well be that people are totally like gung ho on it for their pets. So I think it would be you know it's a nice alternative alternative um, as well. Perfect. Well, you know, and that's, it, it is, I think there's so much that we we kind of think about and you mentioned it and that's so big is we, we add a layer of humanization, mm -hmm. um, not just to the pet food, but 
also to kind of the, the pets themselves and, and keeping in mind how the cats evolved, um, how cats kind of grew as, as a species and what, what made them healthy, like you mentioned earlier in our webinar, um, as in trying to kind of maintain that while we maintain them in our homes as, as ethically and as, import, uh, as, as kind of responsibly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a great balance that we should be looking for on there. Now, Gina does have one, and this one is um, about kind of varied diets, which I'm, I know you're. Uh, I, I know I know exactly where we're going to go on this, but we've got here. So she understands that it's been important to vary the protein source between your dog and cat diets. Um, now, with, while you do have, while you will have a, kind of the mouse diet coming out, should, should there be a more varied diet? Um, such as, you know, her cats have always liked bison, rabbit, or duck uh, mm -hmm. from there. And then kind of from a long-term answer is, what do you have, a, what are you thinking about from there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from a, um, cats can survive. Uh, certainly there's no reason why they couldn't eat a varied diet. Um, they Clearly you feed your cats a varied diet and, and they do well. <laughs> and so it, definitely, you know, uh, as long as the food is nutritionally complete, then, then cats are or dogs or humans or whomever it is, is going to do well. Um, and so uh, with respect to the actual, um, uh, why wouldn't we necessarily feed a varied diet? Um, it can be that actually, unlike humans, where we tend to be, you know, we really thrive on and really love diversity in our diet, cats and dogs um, need it actually much less than humans do. And in fact, um, sometimes they can get some stomach discomfort, having, um, you know, I guess, rotating through diets more, but it depends on sort of the microbiome of your pet too, right? If your pet is really like accustomed to, or is just can sort of roll with having different types of protein coming in, um, then great. Others are a lot more sensitive and they tend to do better on a more um, restricted ingredient list of foods to consume. Um, so I don't think that there's necessarily, I mean, maybe and Chris would be a better person to answer this given that he's the vet, but I would say that as long as the food is nutritionally complete and all of those essential vitamins and minerals are being met, um, then it just sort of comes down to what, you know, what's better for your own individual pet in terms of, yeah, their taste, their, their sort of flavor preferences and their taste for diversity or variety um, or not. Well, and absolutely. And not, you know, I'm just going to echo exactly what you said on there. If it, just to, to let folks know, to, to say on there, you know, there has been some research about some varied diets can improve microbiomes in some cats. But like you mentioned, uh, there's always the chance that you don't want to change diets too much. Or some cats are more prone to gastrointestinal issues on there. So it's like like everything we talk about in cats, it's it's kind of a personal preference for cat and finding out mm -hmm. your unique cat and what works best for your cat um, mm -hmm. would be fantastic as well. And you know, just like mentioned, and we talked long term, like the potential to develop more cell lines of different types yeah. of meat from there yeah. uh, would then allow for this kind of if you wanted to rotate through in a consistent fashion as that goes. Yep, uh, exactly. Yeah, and so unfortunately, that's that's a time answer right now, Gina. Um, that is a time answer, that, but we'll get there. Um, I will. I say will. I say will again because I'm just so excited about this product. But because animals, yeah. we'll get there soon. We'll get there soon. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, now, this is kind of we're kind of rolling right now to the end. I do have one last kind of big question that I'd like sure. to ask everybody, and that is, you know, what we've talked about a lot of different things here. Um, we've talked about the animal agricultural industry, about your process and, and getting people understanding how cultured meat works. You know, if there's what what did we not what did we not cover today that's kind of near and dear to, to you that you feel like is so important for people to understand about this industry and about um, pet food and your product? Gosh, yeah, that's a that's a really great question. But at the same time, I've had so many, um, we've covered so much ground that I, I feel as though, you know, there's been very little that I, I haven't had the opportunity to talk about already. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, gosh, I think I've, I, I guess the only other thing that I would, I would just leave people with um, in terms of sort of um, one of the other, one of the other really exciting things about, um, about cultured meat. And, you know, technology, it, completely infiltrates our lives, right? Like everything we do at this point is sort of based on technology and people seem to, you know, really need a lot of technology in their lives, but we tend to be squeamish when we think about, when we, when we think about technology, biotechnology and food, that's the one area that we tend to be a little bit uncomfortable. And so I think that there will be a little bit of there, 
you know, I fully anticipate this and, and probably also, unfortunately, because of the whole GMO issue. Um, and I should probably actually, the one thing that I would really like to, to, to point out to people is that um, cultured meat is not a GMO necessarily. It's not necessarily a GMO based product. And so people can use GMO technology to grow cultured meat or they can't, they don't have to. And we've opted to take a route where we're not using any GMO technology to grow our meat. So, um, so our, our meat is, is not, yeah, it is not a GMO product. And, um, um, and so the other, even though it is a, a biotechnology, right? And so I guess there's a sort of, it takes a little bit of, there's a mental exercise that goes into this idea of what's natural versus not natural. And so, you know, your reflective instinct might be, or reflexive might be, well, you know, meat from an animal is is the natural, is natural. Um, but when we go, when we think about what goes into actually, yeah, raising and slaughtering an animal um, and then putting it into our pet food, there's nothing natural about the entire process of factory farming. Um, and so what we're doing is, um, uh, so it may not also be natural in that your cat is not running out and, and eating, uh, you know, capturing a mouse and then eating it in that moment. Um, but it's certainly not any more unnatural than than the factory farming industry. And yeah, we do stand to, you know, we have these real benefits by way of safety, potential health benefits, even personalization. So the way that we grow our meat, because we can, you know, optimize media conditions or growth conditions to sort of make sure there's more of one nutrient and less of another. So mm -hmm. pets that actually do require more personalized diets with, you know, a varied nutritional profile, um, we can actually achieve that just in terms of growing our meat. And that's not something that you can just achieve from, you know, taking a slice, a cut of meat from an animal. Um, so there's a lot of promise and there's a lot of opportunity for this technology. And yeah, even though it is technology and it's food, um, I think it, it would do us all well just to sort of sit back and just ask ourselves, though, how really, even though this might seem uncomfortable, is it really uncomfortable? I mean, is it is it is it not actually something that does really stand to benefit us, our pets and the whole world? Um, and of course, my my answer is yes. That's why we're I'm doing this. But um, it, it does it does take a little bit of thought. That's all. Well, and that is such an important thing to know. You know, it's so exciting to have you here. Um, or, or to hear about that and, and the ways that we can use technologies to improve our food and our pets' food. So with me today was Shannon Falconer from Because Animals. So head to their website, www.becauseanimals.com to learn more about their product, or you can go ahead and sign up for their newsletter. Find it back here again real quick at HTTPS, becauseanimals.com slash pages slash cultured meat. Again, everyone, thank, help me, thank Shannon for being here today. Um, and everyone have a great Friday and we'll see you all next, next time. And thanks everybody for watching and thanks Chris and Base Pause for hosting me. Really appreciate of it. Of course, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone, have a good